Morning, Troy. How you doing? I am good. How are you? Doing good. Excited to have you on the show today. You and I uh, have gotten to know each other through our local peer group, Allied, and you have a really interesting story to share with uh, our listeners today. But before we kind of jump into it, can you go back to uh, the day that you decided to be an entrepreneur and tell us how you ended up starting your business? Yeah, so um, I was uh, was attending college and went for about a year and a half and decided that I was uh, essentially burning my parents' money and told them that I was going to take a break because I had no clue what I wanted to do. Um, so I took a job <laughs> hanging drywall, of all things. Um, real good money, but uh, backbreaking work. I respect those guys a lot because uh, those are the guys that can do it their entire life because it's, it's difficult. So I um, had, uh, had a guy, my boss at the time, tell me, he said, hey, you know what? The money's going to start getting good. I was 20 years old. He says, the money's going to start getting good here. And look at me, I'm 40 and I look 80. He goes, you don't want to do this for your whole life. Find something else. So I, uh, that kind of sparked the, okay, what the heck am I going to do? Am I going to go back to college? What am I going to do? And saw the, uh, after we would hang the houses with drywall, there was scraps left over. And we, these guys would come in with a truck and they'd come in and pick up the scrap drywall and haul it away. And I'm thinking, oh God, I can do that. You know? So I don't know for the listeners that are old enough, but you remember the show Sanford and son. Um, I bought one of those trucks and, uh, started scrapping drywall and that evolved into uh, waste disposal and residential collection and commercial collection and roll off dumpsters. And 23 years later, we sold the business. But back to your original question, what made me decide to be an entrepreneur? I think it was my first client. And for the listeners, and maybe everybody was this way when they started to be an entrepreneur, the first thing that attracted me to it was money and freedom. I saw the owner of the drywall company that was my first client and he was wealthy. Um, he seemed to be able to make his own decisions when he wanted, where he wanted, do what he wanted. And that's what I wanted. And I thought, well, here's a vehicle that can at least get me started there. I never imagined the company was going to be around for 23 years. I thought, I'm going to do this for a while. I was making a lot more money than I was hanging drywall doing the scrapping. And I thought, oh, I'll do this for a little bit. And then I'll go back to college and I figure out what I'm going to do. Wow. Well, the boom of the construction market hit. We started in 1994, and we rode that wave all the way to 2007. Um, so that was a that was a great wave in the construction industry for the roll-off dumpsters. So I guess the biggest thing that got me into being an entrepreneur was money and freedom. And we'll probably get to this, but I think the the thing that I learned along the way, and maybe other people, I might be a slow learner, I don't know, but what I learned along the way is, yeah, the money's great and the freedom's great, but what I lost in the, 20, in the end was the passion and being excited every day. And that, and that is what evolved into the selling. Yeah, so. so let's let's peel back, peel that back because I think you know most entrepreneurs. I, I was talking to a guy yesterday about that where the you know the passion is so it's what drive us, drives us as entrepreneurs. You know, was it the fact that there was scraps? What was what was the passion? Where did your where did you get your passion? Was it was it customer service? Was it you trying to change an industry? Like what was it that jumped you out of bed every morning? So that's that's a great question. Yeah, no, it's. Uh, Garbage and recycling and scrap drywall <laughs> were not my passion. They were just they were they were the vehicle for my passion. And I don't think I I recognized consciously what my passion was until about five years before we sold. I loved the sales cycle. I loved the growth. And when we could grow and we were growing at, you know, 25% clips a year. And my I mean my hair's on fire. I love that. I mean, that's what fueled me. And I think what happened was we got to a point, as every business does, you know, you can you can outgrow your cash flow. And we got to a point probably two to three years prior where I sat down with our CPA and and she's like, listen, you're you're knocking it out of the park here. And I'm I'm like, yeah, you know, it's great. She's like, but you gotta slow down because this is you're gonna outpace your uh, cash flow here. Weird thing to say to an entrepreneur, isn't it? And yeah. a typical CPA saying it too. <laughs> yep, yep. So so I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, my wife, she knows me well. And we all sit down with the CPA and they're telling us this story. And 
And I'm like, and I'm looking at Stacy. I'm like, so now what? You know, like that's my thing. I love growing businesses, and that's what's fun. And now you're telling me I got to stop what I love doing. Now I just have, you know, there's always there's always the sales, but there's always the negative munition in the background, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're dealing with just stuff, daily business stuff that, and that never, you know, sparked me like operations and all of that. I. I had an operations manager, so he dealt with that. I loved it. And I just went on. He's like, just go stop. You know, just keep growing this business. We'll take care of the back end stuff. And, so, what uh, was, oh, sorry to interrupt. What, what, yeah. was the, what was the specific technical reason that you were outgrowing your, 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 your business or growing too fast? Was it you, were, you didn't have the correct you know, financing? What was it that their reason was that they gave you? Well, it was, it was such a capital intensive business you know, our return, our return on a sale, you know, what it was a long cycle. And so you would, you'd have to outlay capital and your return might not come for nine months before you're starting to break even on that certain customer. So oh, really? It, yeah. What? What? On the resident, on the residential side. Okay. Um, so you, the cycle of the garbage business is you grow, 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 let it catch up. Grow, 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 let it catch up. Is that because you're financing like the, the trucks and all that, the inventory in yeah. order to actually get the accounts? Yeah. So you're paying the salesperson, you're paying them full commission, you're paying for the carts, you know, and you're only able to charge 20 bucks a month, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, when you got $50 in carts and, uh, or $100 in carts and $50 in a sales rep, it doesn't take long. It takes a while to get recoup that. But once you have the client, you know, so the, basically the, the customer acquisition cost is really high. So, the, so essentially what happened was, is we were at a stage in the business where we were at that five-year cycle. So we were at a point where we say, all right, are we going to dive back in and do this again for another five years or is it time? And what we discovered was, is, you know, the guy leading the charge being me didn't have the passion for it anymore to go grow it again um, and didn't want to do it for another five years. And that's what it was going to take. I mean, we had to, you, you kind of have to go in five year cycles because, you know, you, you draw down capital and whatnot, and then you have to wait for that, all the return back into the coffers, so to speak. And then, and then you're valuable again. So was it a couple of questions on that? Is it, was it, was it that you weren't passionate or was it the you didn't want to take the risk? Oh no, I'm uh, risk calculated risk um, is how I would refer to what we did. I mean, there was a system to what we did, and no, I just wasn't excited about it anymore. I wasn't I wasn't excited to go dive back in and do it again. You know, it's it's trying, it's trying on the owner, it's trying on everybody to go through that because it's because it's got to be aggressive growth. You can't. In that business, trying to grow at the rate of inflation, you know, it's just it it just can't be done. You'll get ran over. So you're competing against some pretty heavy duty uh, companies, you know, worldwide companies, and you're you're the little guy um, trying to compete against the the big dog, so to speak. So where were you when you when it hit you that you weren't passionate about it anymore? My home office with my wife. What, what uh, triggered it? A conversation after that CPA's meeting. And she made the comment. She goes, she goes, I'm going to, I'm really worried about you. And I said, why? And she says, well, because that's what fuels you is the sales. So what are you going to do now? You know? And I, she's like, I don't want you going into operations because, you know, I'll just go mess everything up. <laughs> you know, I'll go in like a bowl in a China shop. <laughs> my operations manager was doing a good job. So it's like, all right, so I got to find my new passion. And so we tried to search for something that I could do, you know, cause they kind of said, give it a couple years, let the, you know, a year is what they said first. And, you know, it ended up being two from that point until we sold. And, you know, after we got through that first year, it really gave me time to think about, you know, I'm, I'm 40, 45 years old right now. And I'm, I gave me time to say, okay, is this really how I want to, you know, wrap up the game, so to speak. And I think if I would have kept going, I think that's what I would have stuck with. And I don't, I don't think it would have satisfied me personally. What were, what were the resources or people 
that you leaned on or explored that helped that mental journey? Um, so, um, my father was in the financial world in his career and, um, trusted mentor of mine. So I, I kind of started, you know, well, first of all, obviously with my wife, but then outside, you know, my father's, uh, was a great mentor of mine and, um, just kind of went through with him what was going on with me. And, you know, he was a CPA and then evolved into other things. So he had the financial uh, background and we just kind of started talking about, you know, what this thing might be worth. Then we engaged uh, our, our CPA um, and brought him into the loop of, you know, this is kind of what we're thinking. You know, what do you think? What do we think this thing is worth? And then um, we kind of we started talking to the potential buyers. Um, so we we uh, talked to the guys that we knew would come with um, cash and we wouldn't have to finance it. Um, we wanted to make sure we, what biggest thing we were concerned about is we knew we could find somebody that would give us, you know, a reasonable offer. The other thing we did when we started out, just to back up a little bit is we actually start out just saying, all right, if this thing isn't worth what we think it is, what do we have to do over the next five to 10 years to get it to be what it's worth? So and, before you go into that even further, yeah. like let's 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 stay on that topic because you know before you even got into the valuations because I want to hear how you valued the company. Um, yeah. Then did you think that selling it was your only option? Did you ever think about keeping it and then using it as just a cash platform? We did. We did. We we thought about that. It was going to require some investment from Stacy and I personally to grow it to the level that we wanted to again. And by default, so we had three different options. We keep it as, you know, I guess, ATM machine or however you want to put it. Yep. And, you know, we hire a GM and bring that in. We dive back in and grow it. Obviously, we can do that. And then we looked at, you know, do we, and then do we keep it with the intent that we're going to sell it at a certain date and a certain strike price? Or is the offer good enough? And you know what? It's time and we want to. We want to sell it and let's let's you know the driver i think behind the entire process was um you know my wife is awesome and she just said we got to find you your passion again because when you're firing on all eight cylinders you know i can get a lot done and, and you're probably more fun at home too <laughs> I, i'm a lot more fun at home <laughs> yeah yeah. So when I'm excited about something, it's, you know, it's a lot better just as most entrepreneurs, right? I mean, I'm no, I don't think I'm unique in that aspect, but, um, so I, I, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, there, no, but. you did. Cause I, I, you know, there's this constant debate that I hear back and forth between, uh, business owners, whether they've sold it or not, and they, whether they got their business or not. And there's like, well, you should just keep it and, you know, let it run, which, is ideal because I mean you again like it's got a it's a cash machine and an ATM like you were saying but there is that mental energy that it it's you're still emotionally tied to it and you know if there's going to be capital requirements and stuff like that you can't actually just keep it as an arm's length as you want it to so I think you know actually you know laying it out like you did there are different options but sometimes it's not as I mean sometimes it is black and white when you really want it to be more gray right right and and I didn't know for sure that because I think. You know, people suggested, well, do you keep it as an ATM machine and you hire a GM or whatever to run the operation? I, I still think you're always tied to it, right? Because you've got all, I got all the risk on the line. I mean, we had 25 units that we were putting out on the road every day. It's huge risk, right? I mean, I always shared with our drivers that, you know, they're driving a, they're driving a lethal weapon down the street and, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I don't know that. Every, well, I know that not everyone could possibly take that as seriously as I did. So part of it was driving that too, is that there's a lot of risk in that business. You know, I mean, you're putting $250,000 trucks on the road and uh, put, driving around. And yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a high risk business, great returns. So I think that was, that had something to do with it as well with the, you know, the hiring of the GM route, just because I'm still on the hook, right? I'm still, I'm still financially, you know, there's a liability there that I have. Yeah, we, we had 26 technicians out on the road and they do stupid stuff, man. Like you yeah. just, just like, and it always yeah. goes back up. <laughs> and I, and I respect our, I respect that our drivers, you know, I mean, we, that was a big thing in the sale as we wanted to make sure we kept everybody on and 
you know, they, that was went really well. But so before it, we go into the process, let's go back to, okay. So now that we understand why you decided to actually sell it, um, how did you guys go about determining the value of it? So we started because we didn't, you know, we always, you know, through our industry, you know, we have associations and whatnot. I talked to other people that had sold businesses and whatever. And there was a time back when there was heavy consolidation in the early 2000s where they were paying just on revenue. Like all the all the acquirers wanted, you know, the waste management of the world and whatnot. They just wanted, they wanted revenue, you know, because they were building the business. Um, what we learned, so I thought that was the way it was going to get valued. And, <laughs> it wouldn't that be yeah. nice, right? <laughs> yeah. And so I thought that's the way it would get valued. And they were paying high multiples. Um, you know, I had, there was numbers thrown around of 18 to 24 months revenue. And so uh, <laughs> pretty, that's, uh, yeah, that's huge. Pretty, pretty lucrative. <laughs> um, I won't get into the details of our operation, but we didn't get that. Um, <laughs> well, and, and cause our, our old, our old industry went back and forth too. And it all depends on the buyer and how they, how they actually peg it uh, yeah. to the value. Because like, I, I, it sounds like your industry is very similar because all of us was our office equipment industry, you have all the capital outline and then it was all about the maintenance, right? So yeah. our, the strategic buyers would come in and they would just knew that they could run everything more efficiently. So again, that was less concerned about the EBITDA than it was more about machines and field or the contract values, which I mean, did you guys have contracts? I guess this is kind of another question. Yeah. Yeah, we did. We had municipal contracts on our okay. residential side. And then on our commercial side, we had individual contracts with all the customers. So, so then how, okay. So once you realized it wasn't on revenue, how did you guys, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, how did you figure that out just by talking yeah. to someone? Or so what? to back up for a second. So the, back in the 2000s, it was 18 to 24 months monthly revenue, but still really nice. Right. So, so I'm going to these buyers that I know are potential buyers and just talking with them. And I start with, you know, they're like, well, what do you think it's worth? And you know, it's back and forth. And, and, and we start talking about that and how things were. And they said, well, that's a thing of the past. And I'm the first guy I'm talking to, I'm thinking, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I went and talked to two or three other guys and they all told me the same thing. So they were all uh, either in coots with each other or that's the way the industry changed. And obviously- So how were you finding those guys to talk to? Were they just- So it's known in the industry who who you got to talk to. Um, I, had, I had had other um, business owners peers that had sold and just kind of talked with them. Hey, who do I go? Who's the person I got to have a conversation with? And eventually these are competitors or were they actually brokers or what? No, no, I'm sorry. I guess I didn't say that. Yeah. They were competitors. Okay. Yeah. So it was strategic and, and that's really the best thing to do in this business is because there's a lot of economies of scale because the chances that these acquirers are already driving on your streets or driving your routes with their trucks Mm -hmm. are pretty, so they essentially can eliminate the trucks and the routes and they get their return pretty quick. So did you, did you like fear that they would, you know, shake up the industry or spread rumors or steal customers or anything when you're doing that? Yeah. I mean, we had confidentiality agreements, so, you know, we engaged attorneys for that and I guess those can be broken too, but no, I, I yeah, of course it was a worry, but once I started talking more with them, I just realized, I mean, I'm dealing with, corporate in Arizona. I'm dealing with corporate. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they don't even, they don't even know who I am, like, because, you know, only the local guys know who I am and it doesn't get to the local level in our business. It didn't get to the local level until, you know, we had, we had letters of intent things signed. I mean, mm-hmm. then, then we were at a point where it's like, okay, you know, we got to engage the local, the local team and, So how did you, as you're having these conversations with them now, and how, how did they explain to you how to get to the value? So they have you fill out this extensive questionnaire um, and you basically lay everything out there. But what it came down to is, so you fill out this questionnaire and they come back with a, with a number. And was it to get to EBITDA or a pre-tax income or what were the, what were the the variables? Yeah. So the, so the, the numbers were, or the things that they looked at were EBITDA, age of the equipment, quality of the team members, because they were buying ours um, not to integrate into their current operation. They actually bought it as an expansion because they bought our building as well. Stacy and I owned the building that we leased, um, that the company leased from us. Mm-hmm. So they bought the building as well, and they're actually keeping the operation there. So it's somewhat strategic, but really they bought it for expansion. So they needed to, in their case, it wasn't just about the revenue or the EBITDA. They wanted to make sure that they had good equipment there as well to continue growth. 
So theirs was an expansion play that is still playing out today. So did you? Did, so it sounds like you know as you're referring to the the, the buyer here. Did you? How did you pick them? As because you, you said you started talking to the to three. How did you narrow it down to that one? And did you want to play people against each other? Because it sounds like you didn't use a broker, so you're kind of nope. navigating the waters yourself, huh? Yeah, yeah. In in retrospect, I think I might have used a broker, um, but it was my first sale of a business, so you know you live and learn, and yeah, did did a lot of things right, but there's some things that we might have done different. I don't know. I saw. But to answer your question, um, so we just. You know, we had the we had the three buyers. I'm sorry. Can you back up? What was the original question? Well, because you you were talking in the tense of you had this buyer that that you filled up this questionnaire because oh, they, yeah. were, they had the expansion. So you went right. from three or a, you know a handful down to one. So just kind of going through, like, just kind of curious your mental process on how you picked them. Was it how much you thought that they were going to pay, or was it like did you have other uh, variables that you wanted to make sure you checked off the box to make sure that you picked that one? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the reminder. I I would say the biggest thing um, was ease. I Stacy and I judged the ease of working with the initial person that we talked to because we knew you you know you're dating in the beginning, but you get darn close to marriage by the time you're done, <laughs> yep. and and it's uh, it's intense, um, very intense process on both sides from the time that we, um, agreed on price until we closed was just over two months. Um, so we cranked it out and we had that wow. done at the end of December. So I think the biggest thing was, is we asked ourselves, who do we want to work with? Um, because I think the price could have gotten to the same number with all of them. I mean, I think, you know, if we continued to negotiate, and I think that the person that ended the company that ended up buying it, we they assured us. Now we ended up getting it written into the purchase agreement, but they assured us that they're going to keep all the employees. You know, we had a lot of. You know, I, I would say that's the hardest part today. Um, I have zero regrets about the sale, but I would say that's the hardest part is that I don't. You know, there's people that I would like to still see every day and. Um, help us build that business. So I think you have the no fact reason to call them anymore, do you? <laughs> it's like, well, I want to go and, chat with you, but like, there's yeah. no like specific professional purpose of the call. Well, and so we, we go to lunch once in a while, we've done that or whatever, but it's, you know, they're, they're doing a job too. So, I mean, they've got a job to do. They got different people to report to now. So you don't want to hold them up on that either, you know, but I would say that those two things, the, the fact of who we're going to work with and felt that if the person at the top which we were doing with corporate was good and easy to work with. We felt that the chances are the organization as it flowed, got down to a local level was also going to be that, or at least we hoped, and we always could have backed out. But, and then the other big thing is, you know, the employees were, it was really important to us that they were taken care of Mm -hmm. and assured us that they were going to be, and contractually we got that written in at least for the first 90 days. And it's turned out to be the, that they've kept them all. Well, so that's that's awesome. Right. We're so, almost not here. So to go back to the because I want to kind of jump in as we're kind of going through the process, the 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 price, right? So I think that as you get this dollar amount, you know what what I went through personally when we went through when we went through our acquisition, um, and then everybody else that I talked to, you get this dollar amount, and then what you actually put in your bank account is usually significantly different. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you get you kind of like want to beat your chest about how cool that gross dollar yeah. amount is, and then like twelve to eighteen months later, you're like, oh crap, <laughs> it's not exactly what I thought. So you know, did you have anybody helping you like understand like? Is that dollar amount going to be enough to, you know, to for a runway to do something else? Or like, how did you financially look at that picture on what you're going to be doing afterwards and whether that hit your current lifestyle? Yeah. So um, I spent a lot of time, like I said, I, I didn't get a degree in accounting by any means, but I had a, a father and a mentor that did and was a CPA. And I've talked to him before about, because I think understanding the numbers and knowing the numbers in your business is like the most important thing, right? In my opinion. And you got to know the numbers on a day in day out basis. So he actually taught me everything I know about accounting. And I've suggested going back to college and he says, for what? And I said, well, you know, to get my accounting degree and make sure that, you know, maybe take some more business class or whatever. He says, for what? You know, everything you need to know because (laughs) <laughs> you've, you've, you've done it. You've done it live. School hard knocks. Yeah. yeah school hard knocks. So he said, I, 
I don't know that you'd gain anything out of that because I know what you know. And so numbers were a big thing to me. So it was always driven into me, you know, the tax consequence. And, you know, I, we obviously did strategic planning as far as our tax planning every year um, and made sure we were within the, <laughs> obviously the rules of the IRS. But, you know, at the end, uh, you, you pay, I mean, one way or the other, the IRS wins. Um, and, uh, you know, so that knowing what that number was, was crucial to me, um, is that, Hey, how high do I have to get this number so that I can get to my number that I'm okay walking away with? Um, and so we backed into the equation and said, all right, if we get this, this is what your potential tax liability is. And then Obviously, we worked with a CPA as well and kind of so you're uh, trying to get back into that net proceeds, back into that net proceeds. And then you got to ask yourself, is that OK? And do I feel that I can do better than that in five years? And then ultimately, do I want to do that? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the answer of can I do better than what we got in five years? Maybe was the answer. And did I think that I could find something that I would want to do that I could be more passionate about? Absolutely. Yeah. That was kind of the thought process. So backing into the answer, I think, is key and understanding the tax consequence um, is huge because it's a big number. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's too big. <laughs> right, right. Well, they, it, always, they always win no matter what. So. You no, know, it's... <laughs> it, it, it is crazy. And there's a, the, the, I could go down a rabbit hole and I won't, uh, the, yeah. the, you know, but to go to bring that back, because what you did for my, from the sounds of it, I mean, you said earlier that you'd made a calculated risk because if you know those numbers, then you know what kind of risk you're putting on the next five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, so did you figure out the, like all the lifestyle stuff that you were doing through the business? Did you have that factored in or were there any surprises that you uh, didn't realize? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question, and I've heard it on some of your other podcasts. Because, um, yeah, because you realize, oh wow, now I got to pay for my own cell phone. Oh wow, <laughs> now I don't get reimbursed for mileage. Oh wow, you know all of these things that. And so, yes, to answer your question, um, because the numbers were driven into me and by other mentors as well, just telling me, hey, operations is one thing, but the numbers drive operations, or vice versa, sometimes, but. The bottom line is, is the numbers what keeps the company alive. So uh, I was fortunate in the fact that my mentors, being my father and others that I, um, through peer groups and other training that I did, you know, it was always driven into me that you got to understand the numbers. So I knew the, I knew the P and L and the balance sheet inside and out. Um, and that is where I spent a lot of time training, even with my CPA, you know, sometimes she would, I would answer questions when we would do our month end review before she would tell me about, or tell me what the answer was. So, um, so I was fortunate in the fact that I understood the P and L well. So yes, I did factor all of those things in as well and said, you know, I'm going to lose these things. And because I'm going to lose these things, I got to get more for the business. Right. <laughs> I talked to a guy yesterday and yeah. he was uh, saying something about a, uh, one of his friends that he sold his business. And he, the guy goes, yeah, for the first time in 30 years, I found out how much a car costs. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a whole different, uh, whole different ball game. So there's a lot of benefits, as we all know, to business ownership, um, and you got to factor those in when you're going to sell. So let's continue down the, the the journey of selling it. So now you're you're at the table. You're you're you've chosen the buyer. You've, you kind of got the price going. Kind of. Walk us through the emotions that you had on the day of closing. Oh, <laughs> intense. I would is how I would describe it. So we were supposed to close on December 16th and we had a one o'clock deadline for a lot of reasons, banks, whatever. There's, there was a deadline and we're at a quarter to one and we've got two hours left of work to do. I mean, at least, and I'm saying this thing's never going to close. Yep. Everybody, you know, the, the attorneys are involved, the closing companies involved, the, title company because we had the building and everything and it blew apart and i'm sitting there thinking on friday night oh my gosh i've done all this work and things not going to close and the buyer is assuring me monday we'll get this done whatever and i'm you know it's a long weekend i'll say what were the hang-ups um there you know i don't recall all of the details but it was dotting the i's crossing the t's type stuff 
And the frustrating part about it was, as I was saying on Monday, hey, we don't have this stuff done yet. Hey, this isn't, you know, due diligence type stuff that they were still going through that wasn't approved yet. And and we have this hard deadline because we wanted we didn't want to get into the Christmas week because we knew we were going to lose a bunch of people, vacations and whatever. Um, so we really needed to get it done. Um, so it was mostly dotting the I's, crossing the T's type of stuff um, that, you know, just agreements and um, certain certain um, true ups, true ups with accounts receivable, um, because we obviously had a large accounts receivable that we were dealing with. Um, when were the bills going to get cut off? You know, transferring those, transferring vendors, all of these things that were, I didn't necessarily think they had to be done before closing, but I learned that they did. So there was a lot of that and, and the closing statement. I mean, the biggest thing was, is the closing statement. Um, we, they had wrong numbers down on, you know, we had some debt that we had to pay off. It's number wrong numbers down on, you know, what the debt amount was to pay off and, So we had to redo the closing statement. That was the biggest thing, I think, is my jarring my memory um, was the getting the closing statement accurate. So eventually, you know, I was told that the buyer will take care of the closing statement. And it ended up being that I I made up the closing statement, sent it back to him and said, do you guys agree? And um, we finally all agreed on the 19th on Monday and ended up taking it right down to the wire again at one o'clock. And I think at 105, they hit the button and uh, it was done. And the emotion to answer your initial question, long answer, but the the emotion at first is high five. I mean, Stacy and I are high fiving, and my wife, and we're excited, and you know, I still get chills about it right now because it was such an intense journey. And then you go, wow, what do I do? What I don't have a business anymore, <laughs> and, yeah. and 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 that count that can come in two tones. I don't have a business anymore <laughs> and I don't have a business anymore. Which one? You know, I mean, so it's that, it's that push pull tug on your heartstrings, so to speak, because uh, back to the scrapping of drywall and it was me, you know, and we built the thing up from nothing. And now to see the entity gone, I mean, it really hit home when part of the contract was, you know, the name of the company was elite waste disposal. And, the part of the what hit home is when within 30 days our attorney had to change the name of the company we couldn't use that name anymore so we had to change it to ewd to finish up tax returns and close out everything and everything and so when you start seeing that there is no elite that really hits home because it's like gosh i built that and there'll never be another elite again right so Um, which one of the i don't have a company in the more anymore were you were you the the excited or the the confused excited yeah definitely excited it was like i said it was the best decision i had my attorney tell me um when it was done that afternoon he says uh he says well i've done a lot of deals and he said six months from now you're either going to say it was the best decision in the world or you're going to regret it and i'm a little over nine months right or coming up on nine months right now and zero regrets was the best decision for me and my family and honestly for the employees i mean i i still talk to my managers and you know a few of the drivers and whatever and they're i think they're better off too i think they would have been good with us but i mean some of them already got promotions and so that's exciting for me and that's a feel-good thing you know a little self-serving but i mean it's it's a feel-good thing that hey while they were frustrated with me when we first said we were going to do it and like, really, you know, how did you tell them? Oh, that was, that was a tough morning. So in the garbage business, we started really early. So we had a 6 a.m. meeting um, because that's when we get going. And we, two weeks prior to the sale. So we didn't have any money in the bank yet, but we had to tell them two weeks before because there was things we had to do from an HR level. That was terrifying. So terrifying, terrifying, right? Um, so I'm going to announce it. So we told the employees, we said, hey, you know, it was a oh my gosh. hour and a half long meeting, but pretty, you know, we had just shy of 40 employees. And um, my wife and I stood up in front of the company and told them what we did or what we're going to do. And then we told them, you can't talk about it for two weeks. <laughs> that must oh, have been a long two weeks. Holy. They... I am, I respect our employees so much because not one person said anything. There were things flying around on Facebook and rumors and all this stuff. And our employees 
were responding back with, I have no idea what you're talking about, whatever. So they were just, they were fantastic. And they had a vested interest in making sure that it didn't get out as well. In what fashion? You know, so I mean, yeah, I mean, they wanted to make sure they were going to keep their jobs. Yeah. Um, so, and for them to keep quiet, I mean, it's hard, right? I said, you know, go ahead and talk with your spouses about it because it's an emotional thing, right? But our significant others or whatever, or closest friend, but, you know, be careful who you talk to because this gets out, it could all blow up. And then we got a company that everyone in the industry knows we're going to sell, but we're not selling. So now how vulnerable do you become in the industry, right? So that was very nerve wracking. So we told them all. And then immediately we had the local general manager and HR director come in. They were in the parking lot and they came in immediately. And that was the best decision we ever made. I debated on whether or not having them there right away. So having the two people from the the acquisition company, local people, the people they were going to deal with locally was the best decision we made. We made some good decisions, but this one was a really good one. Well, um, and I was do, after, what did they do that was that made it the be- like one of the best decisions? Oh, uh, so the anxiety level was extremely high in the room by the time I was done, right? Because I'm telling them you're going to keep your jobs. That's the number one fear, right? Pay is going to stay the same. Benefits are going to stay the same. Like they're going to honor your vacation. They're going to honor your tenure here. Um, so your years served are going to flow right into their system. Like we had it set up so that they didn't lose a thing but there's still fear, right? Mm -hmm. And so having the local guy come in and being able to put a face with this large company that's, you know, they do 10 billion in revenue a year. So this large company coming in and there's fear, right? Because you hear about all the corporate and whatever. And this guy and this HR director calmed everything down. I mean, calmed everything down and said, and hearing it from them that you're going to keep your job. We need you. We need good people. None of your benefits are going to change. And having the HR director tell them none of your benefits are going to change and none of your pay is going to change. I mean, all of those things were so calming and you just watched the employee's shoulders start to sag again. Who's that? Know? Was it to bring them in? There's. Oh, cool. There's. They've been, they've been through enough acquisitions. And so I trusted um, because I hadn't, right? This is my first. Um, and they said, Troy, this is the best. And we've been through this. I'm telling you, this is the way we want to do it. And I trusted them and it it ended up working out. And the, you know, we had that little glitch on the problem, you know, with it not closing on the day of, but that wasn't our acquirers employees necessarily. That was more the, you know, the closing company and that type of thing that didn't have anything to do with this. And it proved to be a fantastic transition. I was, I was, my wife and I were told we needed to be available um, for the first three months. And there was a sliding scale. Of, I can't remember 35 hours a week, the first month, 25, the second month and 15, the last month. And I ended up going in the first week to debrief the GM. And I think they called me in one time after that and asked me to come and sign over the titles to the trucks. <laughs> was that, was that weird? I mean, yeah. And it, you know, so I, I joked with my peer group and I told them, I, you know, I was going through this and kind of they were great counselors as they always are for me. And, and I just said, I said, you know, I can look at this one of two ways and I can say, well, you know, I went through the spiel and told them I didn't, wasn't really needed. And I said, I could look at this one of two ways and say, you know, I, you know, people can look at me and say, what the heck did you do all day? Or I can look at it and say, you know, I had a really well oiled machine that uh, didn't require <laughs> didn't require uh, uh, someone to be running it all day long. And I like to go with the ladder, you know, it makes me feel a little better, but <laughs> so, um, so that, yeah. Does that make you think, re, you know, rethink about maybe of keeping it and letting it become that ATM or do you not have any regrets on that? No, no regrets because I still got the liability. Yep. I, I, I'm the problem, as you know, when you're running a small business is that it's very tough to separate emotion. Right. So I still looked at all my drivers and I didn't look at just my driver. I knew their wife. I knew their kids. And then I I would always think, you know, is my safety guy doing everything he needs to be doing? You know, and um, and they, they did a good job. But ultimately, I'm still responsible for the safety guy who's responsible for the drivers. Right. So 
I'm still responsible for the safety guy who's responsible for the drivers, right? So, so ultimately, I think I would have always been concerned and felt responsible. Um, the garbage industry is, by the Department of Labor, is the sixth, or OSHA is the sixth most dangerous industry. Oh, wow. Um, I did not know that. Yeah. There's a lot of deaths, a um, lot of uh, loss of limbs. Um, there's a lot of things that can happen in the industry. So I think that fear that I would be completely removed and then get the call that, you know, John is gone because he was crushed by a packer. Um, I don't know that I could have looked his wife in the eye and been okay with it. So I think emotionally that was, that was a lot of the driver and not, and, and I, so I don't think I could have disconnected. Yeah, yeah that enough. makes a ton of sense. So you know, what, what do you, okay. So it's been nine months now. Yep. Did you do any mental prep about what you were going to do next? And then now the fact that you have so much more mental uh, capacity and freedom because you're not worrying about that kind of stuff. You know, what do you fill your thoughts with and what is on the, the game plan for the next act? So, um, so we had till the end of March and um, with our, you know, transition, which didn't end up being a lot for me, a little more for my wife. She was more, she upped kind of on the financial side um, with more of the in the weeds type of stuff. And so I was working on a 1031 exchange, trying to exchange into another real estate property and um, ended up not panning out. And I, that didn't end up come into fruition until probably the end of may and started talking uh, with my with stacy about you know what's next and what do i do and i always heard former business owners saying take time off take time off as much as we're all entrepreneurs and we want the next thing right we all want the next thing we, we we're wired that way we can't help it and take the time off and let your brain rest and so I did that and I took off June, July and all of August and up until the kids went back to school. And it was, it was the best decision I've ever made. I mean, so you literally, actually, you actually did let your brain rest. Yeah. So I took the whole summer and, you know, and there was little things here and there just because you talk to people and we're wired to be business owners, but no, nothing to the effect of what I was doing. So I really let myself unplug. We took a bunch of vacations, took a long 18 day vacation out east and just spent some time, you know, bonding with the kids and uh, my wife and just ha having that time together. Because, as you know, when you're in a family business, the whole family's involved. And, uh, you know, through the sale, the kids, you know, they they know what's going on. You know, they, they, they can feel there's something happening. Um, so I think taking that time off and then getting myself to a point to, the, to today and saying to myself, so do I take more time off or do I start looking at things and you're excited again, right? I mean, you're, I'm rejuvenated. I'm, I'm excited about looking into different opportunities. So that's, that's what I'm doing right now. And you do a lot of soul searching through this process and realizing you start asking yourself questions about, you know, not necessarily what do I want to do, but who do I want to work with? You know, who do I want to spend my days with? And what I came up with is I want to spend it with business owners. Um, I, and I don't know what that looks like yet completely. Um, but I do know that I want, and I started with like-minded people is what I started with. And then it evolved into, well, what are the like-minded people? Well, there are other business owners. Um, I understand business. I've, I've been through, um, as you mentioned earlier, the school of hard knocks, um, and have learned a lot along the way and have just become essentially a lifetime learner. I mean, that's, that's, I love learning new stuff. So I'm really excited about what I'm going to learn next. Um, mm -hmm. and learning from other business owners and hopefully helping them make their businesses better. And the biggest thing I want to do is I made a lot of mistakes along the way. I would like to help people not have to go through that pain, you know, of those mistakes and help them through the process of, you know, if, if they are going to sell, you know, Hey, these are the things that happened to me. I mean, what you're doing is awesome. I love, I love that you're, you know, starting something up because I think people need that. They need that help. I would have loved to have known about you, <laughs> but I would really love to have known about me before we sold too. <laughs> right. So, um, so I think you're, what you're doing is great. And I, and I could see myself 
in that some type of that capacity. But I do know that I want to do something. What what books are you reading or who are you talking to that's helping you in this process? I think that's the biggest challenge that people have is so like when you were on vacation for those three months and you like wake up and you're like pulling out, is it, is it newspapers? Is it books? Is it people like what are the, you know, the top one or two things that's helping you? Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I truly unplugged Ryan for those three months. So I didn't do a lot of reading. Um, I forced myself to let my brain rest and not do a lot. I really just spent a lot of time asking myself, you know, sounds a little kind of philosophical, but who am I? Right. right. But what do I represent? Um, what value can I provide to others and make an impact? Um, you know, a lot of the things I've heard before on your podcast is, you know, what do we want to do? I, I want to make an impact. I want to make a difference. And I think I have the skill set and the ability to make a difference with other business owners because I've been there and I've done that. So as far as not a lot of books, but I would say um, more just just reading, um, you know, publications, you know, like things like simple as like the business journal. So I would read that and then I'd be conscious about my emotions while I'm reading it. Mm -hmm. You know, does reading about business even excite me anymore? Yeah, it fuels me and I got to stop because I know what rabbit hole I'm going down. (laughs) Yeah, when I when I put down the papers, I'm like, oh, I got this idea, and oh, I could do this, and I could do it, you know. So I can I can fly off the handle real easy. And next thing you know, my wife's going, I thought we were taking the summer off. Oh, uh, the truth. So I so I would say, and now um, getting back into business reading books, you know, I'm intrigued by the EOS. I've never I never had time to actually read through the traction and things like that. But you actually did unplug. It's I think you know you're you're doing Troy what I think a lot of people struggle with, which is asking the intrinsic question. Because if you've got the if you got the money, if you've done the first whole shebangs, now it's really asking about what the whole picture is all about, and it's it's a tough question. I don't think you ever really answer it. Yeah, it's. I would agree. I would agree. I think it's an evolution um, because you you start with right. So you ask yourself, well, how do I want to spend my days? Well, I love golf, but you can only play so much golf, right? So, um, so how do I want to spend my days? What's going to fuel that fire of growth? So what do I like doing? Well, I love growing companies. Um, well, I love talking with business owners, you know, such as yourself and whatnot. I mean, we have so much in common. So how can I do that? And, you know, I can't remember where I saw it. Would you see the three circles of, you know, the, the definition of retirement is you're doing something that you love doing every day. You're extremely skilled at it. And oh, a bonus, someone pays you for it. <laughs> you know, I mean, if I, that's the definition of retirement for me, if I can, if I can find that where I wake up every day and I'm, I'm excited, right. I'm excited. I feel like I'm going to make a difference and oh, whoops, someone paid me for it too. <laughs> you know, that's just, that's just, that's just that's just icing on the cake, right? But yeah. back to coming full circle, back to why did I get into business? You know, it was the money and the freedom. And it's funny how now on the back end, the money is the last thing, right? So, but you're in a different position too after you sell the business. So it can be, right? So you mm-hmm. can have that attitude. Um, and it's I feel very fortunate and blessed that I'm in the position I am because it's. It's exciting that I, you know, at 45 years old, I get to, I get to write the next chapter. So that's exciting. I love it. I absolutely love it. You did some really good. I love that I'm definition. I'm, that's, I'm definitely putting that down. <laughs> that little three cycles. That's, that's fantastic. Yep. Um, Troy, uh, what is the best way for our listeners to get in touch with you? Well, because I'm not in any company yet, I'll give you my uh, Gmail, T Shooty, S C H U E T T E. 611 at gmail.com. Troy had a blast having you on the show.